The cost to society for teenage pregnancy is unbelievable. Teenagers are undoubtedly the political football in the abortion battle in the United States. Young girls are those that are mostly affected or who die from illegally uh, committed abortion. It was the law. It was the law that you know, made her die. How many young women will share Becky's fate if we continue to allow our government to deny them a safe choice? In 1973, access to a safe legal abortion became every American woman's right. Thousands of senseless deaths from unsafe illegal abortions stopped. Since then, the Supreme Court, in a series of decisions, has cut back abortion rights, first for poor women, then for sick women, and now for young women. I'm Christina Pickles, an actor and a mother. What is happening to our teenage women is frightening. In June of 1990, the Supreme Court, in yet two more harsh abortion decisions, dramatically curbed minor women's rights to legal abortion. At first look, requiring an unmarried teenager under 18 to involve her parents in an important decision seems reasonable. But the evidence is overwhelming that parental consent and notification laws are devastating to young women. History is repeating itself. Our daughters are dying again. Our daughter died needlessly. She made a mistake and became pregnant. And because the laws regarding parental consent, she further compounded her initial mistake with another and paid for it with her life. She died of an illegal abortion. In confiding with her best friend, she said, I don't want to disappoint my parents. I love them so much. Well, we don't have our daughter. Rebecca Suzanne Bell. She died September the 16th, 1988. It shattered our family when she left because she was the sunshine. She was beautiful inside and out. She was my life, my dreams. Uh, she loved everything about life. She was such a spontaneous person. She'd do things. She'd, we'd walk down the hall and she'd say, I feel like doing a cartwheel. And she'd just do a cartwheel in the hallway at school and embarrass you. And I'll remember her laugh. She had the goofiest laugh. I'll never forget her. There's not a mother and a father who wouldn't want to know that their child is in trouble. But I think Becky's situation is clear indication that as loving and as close as a family can be, there is no way that you can be assured that they're going to come to you in this time. I didn't even know there was a law existing until after my daughter's death, uh, which caused her death. To me, that law did it. Becky Bell sought an illegal abortion because of Indiana's parental consent law and died from it. Parental consent and notification laws have passed in some 33 states, though many have been blocked by courts. In more than a dozen states, these laws are already strictly enforced, and the 1990 Supreme Court decision invites many more to follow suit. Notification laws, mandatory parental notification laws, and mandatory parental consent laws, in the eyes of the minor, and that's who we're talking about, they are exactly the same. It is that the minor does not want to have to tell the parent and will do anything, and I do mean anything, to avoid doing that. The fact is, if you have a very good relationship with your child, they may be less likely to come to you because they don't want to hurt you, they don't want to tarnish their image with you, and so what they will do then is to try to solve this problem on their own. She talked to the boy and said that she was pregnant, and he said, just get the hell out of my life, I don't want you. So Becky went to Planned Parenthood. She told them that she wanted an abortion, and they said, in Indiana, Becky, you have to have permission from one of your parents to have an abortion. And she, they said, you have to tell them. And she said, I can't. I love them too much. And she just, she gave her life, trying to take care of her 
herself. What are the choices for a young woman like Becky living in a parental consent or notification state where the law is enforced? In some states, she must notify one parent. In others, both parents. In other states, she must obtain the consent of one parent, and in still others, she must have the consent of two parents. If she cannot do this, she must travel to a non-restrictive state or go to court and seek a judge's waiver known as a judicial bypass. Many girls, unable to do any of these, freeze and drift further into pregnancy until it's too late or, like Becky, turn to the back alleys. Now, this doesn't mean that no minor wants to tell her parents about a pregnancy. In fact, about 50% of minors do voluntarily go to one parent or both parents about their pregnancies. But those minors who feel they cannot go to one or both parents will do almost anything or do nothing rather than risk exposure of the pregnancy. And we did show that that's what was happening in Minnesota. From 1981 to 1985, Minnesota teens lived under an especially punitive law that was later blocked by a court but reinstated in 1990 by the United States Supreme Court. By law, a young woman must inform both biological parents before undergoing an abortion in a state where 50% of minors don't even live with both parents. My mom and dad were divorced when I was five years old, so I wasn't living with my dad. So when my mom called to set up for an abortion, we found out that in order for me to have an abortion, even though my mom was going to be with me, I would have to go through court. I had never met my natural father, so I didn't feel like he was needed to be told and meet me for the first time on that grounds. He would hit my mom or, you know, hit us kids, and he was an alcoholic. I also had a stepfather who didn't know about it, and I didn't want him to find out about it. If this became an issue and if father found out about the pregnancy, then not only was the, the daughter in danger of being physically assaulted or abused, but the mother was too. He became very, very abu verbally abusive to me and called me names like a slut and a whore. He didn't want to really have anything to do with me. And he plays it against me and my sisters and tells my sisters they can't talk to me and we don't have a relationship anymore. The parental notification law tore Natalie's family apart. And many of the thousands of young women who flooded the Minnesota courts were doing so for their physical safety. Every one of them had an excellent reason for being in court and not notifying their parents. 90% of the time, maybe even closer to 100% of the time, it was because of fear of abuse being physically assaulted and thrown out of the house. And she's indicated that my mother said she would really beat me up and throw me out of the house. And surprisingly, when the parent is confronted with this in my office, that's the response I get. I recall particularly a girl that had been raped by her brother and, and became pregnant as a result, and she couldn't uh, tell anybody about it. She said she doesn't want to tell her mom and dad because the last time her dad got mad, he hung her by a chain from the ceiling. We're talking about dysfunctional families. And for our legislators, you know, to uh, try to uh, pull the wool over our eyes of saying every parent is a caring parent simply is not true. Like the legislators, the Supreme Court ignored massive evidence of violence and damaged family relationships and upheld the two-parent notice with the judicial bypass as constitutional. Not one of these laws has allotted one penny for helping teenagers and their families really talk about the problem, give counseling to teenagers. They're all criminal statutes. These laws all want to put people in jail. The Supreme Court also chose to ignore that the judicial bypass is discriminatory, and it frequently does not work at all. The kids we saw were maybe 99% white, that they tended to be suburban, middle-class, white kids who had goals in life to go to college, to vote tech, to get a job. Once you have gotten into the system, who will you be talking with? And it will primarily be white males. But even for those who make it to court, the experience is traumatic. And the court experience for me, I had felt like I had, I had done something criminally wrong. And I was very scared, very confused. There were about maybe 10 other girls waiting. I mean, there was absolutely no privacy. I mean, anybody could have walked by that you would have known. And, you know, it's just like, Everybody knows what you're sitting there for. 
The one thing that I worried about was that I'd see my dad because he works downtown. The count is almost up to 23 people that they would either have to talk to or that they would have to see. Your privacy is stripped away. You're punished, even if you can get an abortion. Young girls have been punished. And in some states, like Massachusetts, young women were harassed by the judges. But perhaps the most significant weakness of both the law and its bypass lies in delaying prompt medical care to young women in what is, after all, a race against time, a pregnancy. Even the possibility that a bypass procedure could take 22 days in an Ohio case did not stop the Supreme Court from approving it. It's impossible for a teenager to call up from some little town and make arrangements and, and not be delayed maybe several weeks, maybe thrown into the second trimester where the risks are much higher. In some states, judicial bypass hearings are difficult to come by. In Massachusetts, a number of judges refuse to hear such cases. In Minnesota, judicial bypass hearings and abortions are only available in two locations, the Twin Cities and in Duluth. In Duluth, there are no doctors to perform abortions. So, once a week, weather permitting, Dr. Jane Hodgson flies in from Minneapolis, knowing dozens of women and girls are depending on her. Well, I think Duluth says a lot about abortion access in America. I mean, in Duluth, it's often 20 and 30 below zero in the wintertime. We had some of our plaintiffs in the Hodgson case who would hitchhike at 4 in the morning from the Iron Range in that kind of stormy weather, hitchhike, get to the Duluth Clinic, have an abortion, and hitchhike home again in the afternoon. If you're coming from Grand Forks, North Dakota, which is five hours away from here, what time do you have to get up to be here at 7? H how do you leave your house at 1 o'clock in the morning? What do you say to the people you live with? And what if you're 15? How do you do it then? In Minnesota, after the law was passed, the percentage of teenage women needing riskier, more costly second trimester abortions increased by 26 and one half percent. Still, the Supreme Court ruled this law was not an undue burden on young women. We know that the law is anything that's restrictive is going to reduce the number of abortions and increase the number of compulsory pregnancies. It will send some of the teenagers out of the state. It will, some will think of self-abortion. For approximately 40 percent, the birth rate went up in the state for teenagers under the age of 18. And I think one of the reasons was that abortion became less accessible to them. These judges tend to be white, male, middle class. I think if you would have asked them 10 years ago, would you support having to tell parents, they would have all said yes. These judges said across the board, they testified in federal court that these laws were terrible. What, what would you say to somebody who said that this increases, this improves family communication? That person's full of bullshit. There was no one in the room of either side that believed that that was their intent at all. Their intent was simply to cut down the number of abortions. It's at, uh, at best a waste of our time at worst, a barrier endangering their lives, and it's just absolutely nonsensical. But the nonsense can turn deadly when the girl must face a judge who doesn't even believe that abortion should be legal. That was the case for Becky Bell in Indianapolis, where the word on the street was no judge would grant a waiver. It appears Indiana grants only about a dozen waivers each year. There are judges who are known to be anti-choice, Attorneys that have practiced before those courts uh, would find it a futile effort to uh, seek a judicial waiver there. You know, I, I just absolutely infuriates me to know that my daughter just happened to live in the wrong state. You know, how can someone explain this to me? She really didn't have many choices. She couldn't go in front of a judge. She couldn't go to Kentucky or to another state <coughs> to get the abortion because she didn't have any mode of transportation, and she couldn't get away. Her parents knew where she was. She always told her parents where she was. She didn't have many choices. In Indiana, the record shows that a judge's decision on a minor's abortion will stand virtually unchallenged. It is so difficult to obtain a waiver that a 14-year-old in permanent foster care, even with the permission of her foster mother and a court-appointed referee, was denied a waiver by a judge. The state Supreme Court upheld his decision. Essentially, you cannot then, if your local judge denies the waiver, get that decision reversed by the Supreme Court because they're not going to look at the facts of the case. They're only going to look at the procedure. She's forced to have a child against her will. And of course, 
If they can stop them as teens, they can stop them as adult women. And they have every intention of it. There will be babies, babies, babies. There will be no choice for women. As more politicians and state legislators push for parental consent and notification laws, they are finding themselves in direct odds with the medical profession. You don't see the minor patient because of the parental consent law. It cuts them off before they even get to the physician. In those issues of health which are sensitive and private, the young person will not reveal them to the physician if they sense that confidentiality will be violated. The American Public Health Association, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Psychiatric Association, American Association of Child Psychiatrists, the Association of Adolescent Medicine. All of these organizations think these laws and regulations would impact negatively on the health of adolescent young women. We have special laws in our states to give teenagers uh, the ability to consent to treatment for pregnancy, for venereal disease, for drug abuse. But when it comes to abortion, we're not allowing them to make that decision. That is entirely inconsistent with the type of welfare that we're trying to uh, promote in our society. Teenage pregnancy does not only injure the young woman, the statistics say it all. When it comes to children having children, everybody suffers. The total figure for caring for women who have had children as teenagers is about $20 billion annually. That's what it's costing the American taxpayer. The rate of teen pregnancies, births, and abortions in the United States is the highest of all industrialized nations. These statistics are true for both white teens and teenagers of color. Now, many people say that's because of sexual activity and permissiveness and so forth in the U.S., but in fact, if you look at countries like Holland and England, and France and many others, sexual activity rates are the same. It's just that other countries are more comfortable and more positive in encouraging responsible sex, discussion of it, use of contraception. Though most of us would prefer that our children delay sex, we live in a sex-drenched culture. We give sex education too little, too late, and withhold contraceptive information and access. The result? Only a third of teenagers use contraceptives regularly. And even for them, failure rates are higher than for adult women. What's more, three quarters use methods that offer no protection against AIDS and other sexually transmitted diseases. Very few teenagers know all the methods of contraception available. Not that we have a lot of choices in the United States, unfortunately, but they don't know even some of the choices that we do have. Will parental consent laws for abortion lead to parental consent laws for contraception? Already in 21 states, some health care providers are requiring parental involvement. If teens had to notify their parents that um, they were using birth control. The youngsters would still be sexually active and they probably would not be using a contraceptive method. We withhold access, we withhold permission, and what happens is that 20% of teenagers get pregnant their first time within a month after they start having sex and 50% get pregnant within the first six months. So it isn't working. Over a million American teenagers become pregnant each year, five out of six unintentionally. Forty percent of all American women become pregnant in their teen years. The incidence of teenage pregnancy in this country is a public health nightmare. I cover the delivery room on Mondays, and there are Mondays where, where all ten delivery rooms and labor rooms are filled with people under the age of 16. Young girls are at higher risk when they have babies. They're considered high-risk pregnancies. For a young teen to have a baby, it is 24 times more dangerous than to have an early abortion. Pregnant adolescents suffer higher levels of toxemia, anemia, hypertension, cervical trauma, and premature labor. But a young teenage mother risks even more than her physical health. She and her family will become casualties in the feminization of poverty. 67% of teenage mothers and children will live in poverty, and only one in 50 finishes college. A low uh, educational achievement, uh, the inability to get a job that's going to be a good-paying job, 
that's going to have her support herself and her child well. Um, usually poor access to health care. Having a baby just stops them dead in their tracks. A small percentage of these desperate young women will resort to placing their babies for adoption. Young, white teenagers and preteens are the most likely to do this. But research and statistics raise chilling questions about the multi-billion dollar foster care and adoption system. I think when it comes to abortion, there's a better way. The way of adoption. Adoption expert Reuben Panner was the director of an adoption agency for 30 years. One of the things that distresses me is to have heard two presidents make statements that instead of abortion, children should be placed for adoption. This is uh, a gross lie. There are lots of children, uh, too many children in this country right now, who are not able to live with their mothers and or fathers. And one of the things that we're facing in this country is a tremendous shortage of foster parents. America's foster care system is breaking down. There are 450,000 children who have been removed from their parents, and by the year 2000, there will be a million. There are approximately 35,000 children who today are waiting and ready and available to be adopted. There are no adoptive families for these children. The demand is for white Caucasian infants, placing uh, black children, placing handicapped children, placing sibling groups of children. These children are placed through county agencies, and they're having a terrible time finding homes for these children. With the legalization of abortion and the greater societal acceptance of single motherhood, the supply of white babies available for adoption has dropped dramatically. The wait for a white, healthy infant at adoption agencies can be long. But the interesting thing today, though, is that if you have the money, an attorney will find a child for you within six to nine months. It's through a very seductive process uh, where they go into a underprivileged community, find underprivileged birth parents, offer them all kinds of inducements, and then uh, have their, that child placed for adoption. Independent adoption attorneys and so-called baby brokers who operate independently of licensed adoption agencies can charge exorbitant fees. The average fee is probably now closer to 20 or 25 or even 30,000. And I have seen, uh, I've worked with couples where the fee has been up to 40 or 50,000. And I know that uh, higher fees are also paid. That could go up to 100,000. Adoption agency fees, although more moderate, vary widely from minimal amounts for minority or special needs babies to a high of 12% of the adoptive parent's gross annual income. It is worth noting that some anti-abortion groups operate adoption agencies. We understand from the evidence that some agencies are indeed charging again based on the ability of people to pay. And it would be a real tragedy in this country then if the more money you have means the kind of child that you can adopt. That would be very chilling. But while the price for healthy white infants continues to rise, hundreds of thousands of other children wait in an overloaded system for the families that never come. If abortions were not available, we would reach a, a point where we would find ourselves exporting children to other countries. Recently, the world was shocked to discover that Romania was exporting babies because its deposed dictator had banned both contraception and abortion. Orphanages overflowed and the Romanian death rate from illegal abortion soared to one of the highest in the world. But Romania was not that unusual. Where abortion is illegal or inaccessible, women die. One every three minutes throughout the world. And teenage women number high among the casualties. We're seeing in increasing numbers of young women having abortions illegally in those countries where it's illegal in Latin America, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and in uh, parts of Asia where it is illegal. My uh, work has taken me to Brazil, to Honduras, to Bolivia, and to Guatemala. Fifty percent of the hospital beds in Brazil and in Colombia are filled by women who had complications of self-induced abortions, attempted abortions or induced abortions. 
From my experience, I would say that most of those who die from illegal abortion are young children. They do not have the kind of access they should have to information and education. Throughout the world, the denial of sex education, birth control, and abortion shatters the lives of women and girls. To deny these realities is to deny young women their right to make decisions that will shape the whole course of their lives. We need only look at our own country to see the consequences. Becky Bell's death echoes that of a 17-year-old girl from the recent past. Needless tragedies we must not let happen again. I remember uh, very vividly when I was a third year medical student down in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, it was 1965 or 1966, a young 17 year old woman came into the emergency room of Hubbard Hospital. At four o'clock in the afternoon, we took her to uh, this doctor. They x rayed her, and her left lung was full of pneumonia. Her face was distorted and swollen and they said, get her to the hospital now. She's bad. Her temperature was 105. Uh, she was in shock, and she was clearly very, very sick. The pneumonia and the infection in Becky was so, it was running so rampant through her body, it, it virtually destroyed her lungs. When he opened up her abdomen, it was full of the most awful-looking yellowish-green pus that I had ever seen. She laid and she died. I held her hand. I kept saying, Becky, what's wrong? Tell mommy. And she wouldn't. She just wouldn't for anything. The catheter had gone through the backside of her uterus and carried all of the bacteria and the toxins, uh, not only into her uterus, but also into the rest of her body. And the cause of death was listed as a septic abortion with pneumonia as a, as a contributing factor. It was very sad. It was very moving, and probably the signal event in my professional career that made me understand that such a loss of life um, is so useless. That women, at some times during their lives, will be so desperate when they find themselves pregnant and don't want to be pregnant will put their lives and their health on the line to terminate that pregnancy. I just want everybody to remember Becky and what happened to us. And I have the graveyard now. If she would have had an abortion, her parents would have been there for her. She could have graduated from high school, gone to college. She had a lot of dreams, too, that she wanted to fulfill. She wanted to have a big family. She was a friend that was always there for you. It makes me really angry that she would be here. She'd be sitting here next to me, and everything would be just like it was before had the law not been what it was. She was my best friend. I mean, she was like my sister. I grew up with her, and we had so many memories. And now she's gone. <laughs>